Hi everyone, hello. We're going live. Um, it's 417 in Los Angeles. I'm here in Los Angeles for about a month doing work and getting some stuff done. And um, it's for all you folks on the East Coast, I guess it's 717 and probably pretty cold, but it's very cold here in Los Angeles as well. The reason we wanted to do a live is, hi everyone, hello Jack Be Nimble. We are doing a live because, believe it or not, this week marks the one year anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And obviously it's been a, a hugely significant geopolitical story um, and a very important thing to discuss. And one of my favorite people to talk to is uh, Michael McFall, he's the former U.S. ambassador to Russia. He's a big deal, everyone. He's a very big deal and very smart. He teaches right now international studies at Stanford, and he's going to talk about what we've learned this year and what the future may hold uh, in Ukraine. I'm going to give you some statistics while I see if Michael is logged on. Not yet. So let me just got, give you guys some quick updates. Um, so... There have been more than 8 million refugees who have fled Ukraine. Uh, it's the largest movement of people in the European region since the Second World War. Analysts estimate about 200,000 Russian troops have been killed or wounded, and Ukraine has seen some 100,000 killed or wounded in action, as well as over 30,000 civilian deaths. Um, civilians have been raped, tortured, and murdered, and, and the dead hidden in mass graves or left to rot in yards and along roadways. Obviously, it's been just a horrible, horrible year in Ukraine. That's the understatement of the year. Um, let me see if Michael is joining us now. Thanks so much me for too, doing this, too. Mike. We Good just to wanted to talk. Somebody actually just taught, asked about the cost of sure. rebuilding Ukraine, which we can talk about in a moment. But before we talk about that one year in, how would you say, you know, how has this war been a turning point for really for, for the entire world? Well, it is, I think it'll be read in history books as the end of the post cold war era, right? If you go back to 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. It felt like the whole world wanted to be democratic and close to us. We were the hegemon. Uh, my colleague here at Stanford, uh, Frank Fukuyama, wrote a very famous article called The End of History. And it was a, time, it was a very optimistic time, as you'll remember, right? And, and this, I think, puts a period to that era. Uh, this is a, you know, it's the first major war in Europe since 1939. Um, it's the first war of imperialism for a long, long time, right? Remember, after World War II, 1945, we, we said at the United Nations, we're going to end empires. We're going to get rid of them. And there was this fantastic stretch of three decades. Some of it was violent, but where lots of countries in Asia and Africa, uh, we ended empires. This is another war of imperialism, right? It's Russia trying to retake and control its former colony. And then third, another thing we got rid of, because it was what started World War II, was annexation, right? And uh, when they got together in 1945 and founded the United Nations, uh, they basically said, no more annexation. We don't want to have a world where big powers just take chunks of little powers whenever they want. And let's be clear, there were, there have been periods of annexation over the last 70 years. Uh, there are bits and pieces of that. But by and large, there haven't been. This is now a war of annexation right back in the heart of Europe. So it's tragically a major turning point. Do you think we miscalculated um, we uh, Vladimir going. Putin? I was reading recently that George W. Bush told Barack Obama when he was coming into the White House to really watch Putin. Um, I, I read so many things. I think that was right. Um, but but do you think we were lulled into almost a sense of complacency when it came to Putin? Uh, yes and no. I mean, going back to the period of the 90s, we thought, and by the way, this was Russia and China, that if we just engage with them, we bring them into our clubs, like the World Trade Organization, we trade with them, eventually we're just going to kind of socialize them 
into our system, right? And when I say our, I mean those institutions that the United States set up, right? That didn't work. Uh, that uh, didn't work with Russia, didn't work with China, but it took us a while to figure that out. So in the 90s, we were still trying it. And by the way, succeeding, let's not, let's not get too fatalistic about this. Russia could have been a different place with a different leader. There's no doubt in my mind about that, that had Yeltsin chosen his real heir apparent at the time, the one he really wanted, a guy named Boris Nemtsov, the history would have been different. But he went instead with Putin and over time, he moved farther and farther away from us, and then he became more autocratic and more paranoid that we were supporting democratic movements mm -hmm. against him, including in places like Ukraine. Um, but when I was in the government, I was there for five years from day one with President Obama. I would say President Obama had no illusions about Putin, a pretty sober assessment. Um, what we didn't do right, and I would say this of us, I would say this of President Bush, and President Trump, uh, and even President Biden in the first year, um, we didn't do enough to help those around Russia. Uh, I mean, think about, you know, we've had this debate about NATO expansion or not, it's still going on. Some people still blame us for this war because of NATO expansion, which I think is uh, absurd. Uh, I was just in Munich four days ago at the Munich Security Conference and met lots of, uh, you know, East Europeans that are in NATO and they all say, Thank goodness for NATO. If, if we didn't have NATO, us here in Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania and Poland, we would be in real trouble right now. So I think that was the right strategy. I think in uh -huh. retrospect, we should have done more of that. We should have been more aggressive. And, and, and in the 90s, when we had power and Russia was weak, brought in others and brought in military assistance as to a the way surrounding to countries. Putin from doing the things he did. Exactly, because every time he used force, you know, Georgia 2008, he invaded Georgia. Uh, we denounced him. This is when President Bush was in office, but we didn't provide military assistance. We, we didn't sanction anybody. 2014, he invaded Ukraine again. That's when he took Crimea and supported separatists in Eastern Europe. And President Obama, I was out of the government by then, but President Obama put in place sanctions with Angela Merkel, but in retrospect, it wasn't enough. And now tragically, yeah. we're here where, yeah. you know, and if I third time around, remember, and this time it's bigger than ever. If I remember ever, correctly, Mike, the by the way, everyone, we're talking to the former U.S. ambassador, now Stanford professor, Mike McFall, about the one-year anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And it seems to me, I remember talking to you a year ago, right after my yoga class, I we hopped on an Instagram live and, um, it, and and it was it it seemed weird to me because they had been getting into position for weeks maybe months but it seemed like yes we yes it felt like people were a little bit asleep at the switch that they I don't know were they you know operating in magical thinking I just don't know why they didn't why sort of the international community didn't do more as they were clearly preparing to invade. With a year of hindsight, have you been able to figure that out? Well, you're absolutely right. You're remembering that right. And even I would say President Zelensky uh, just did not want to believe that this was going to happen. And I think in retrospect, two reasons. To their credit, uh, the US intelligence community got it right. Um, CIA, uh, they got it right. Uh, Bill Burns, the head of the CIA, he's a former friend. Of, he is a friend of mine and a former colleague of mine. I give them a lot of credit. Not only did they have the intelligence, we've made a lot of mistakes in the past, right? With our intelligence, this is one we got right. And then they did the really innovative thing. They declassified that information as a way to try to get our European allies uh, ready for this. But I think there were two things. One, it just we we haven't had a war like this for seven decades and it was beyond people's imagination that putin would actually do this and i think that's that's how we got it wrong we just could not believe that he would be so crazy as to go back to something that we thought we had gotten rid of what do you think putin's frame of mind is obviously i mean i think one of the shot probably by the way is 
pouring in Los Angeles. This weather is so crazy. And I guess there's a storm system all across the country. I don't know what's happening in Palo Alto right now. But, you know, um, it, it, uh, it seems like he was in for a rude awakening when it came to the Ukrainian resistance movement and the, the, the power of President Zelensky yeah. and the, you know, the fact that he was able to, I mean, it, it was pretty extraordinary. He, I think he deserved to be Times Man of the Year, but our person of the year. Um, but, but what do you think Putin is thinking now? I know that their intelligence shows that they're going to do some big um, assault in the next few weeks. Those weeks are going to be critical. But uh, Russia is, I mean, what have, what have we learned about the Russian military, I guess, over the last year, Mike? And if anyone has questions, please put them in the question section. So I talked about how great it was that we got that intelligence assessment right about that Putin was going to invade. I want to say, secondly, we were horrifically wrong about our assessment of what was going to happen in the war. And we need to say that soberly and figure out why we got it so wrong. Because in the run up and in the initial days of the war, the consensus in the United States government and around the world was this is going to be over in three or four days. Uh, and that the Ukrainians had no chance. Um, I think we've learned two things. One, uh, on the Russian side, that there was a lot of corruption in the military. You know, if there's corruption throughout the whole economy, why didn't we think it was going to be in the military? And that, you know, you can look and count tanks and count soldiers and count, you know, percentages of GDP spent on the military. But if there's a lot of corruption and they're not taking it seriously, you don't have the fighting force that you thought you had on paper. But second, as you rightly pointed out, we underestimated Ukrainian warriors. Um, and I remember, you know, as you can imagine, I was on a zillion phone calls, sometimes even with the president of uh, the United States in, in this period. And I was always, you know, I'm an academic. I'm a, so, you know, I'm always wanting data. And I was always struck by, there seemed like we had an army of experts on the Russian military and hardly anybody that knew anything about the Ukrainian military. Um, but because you're in California, I'm in California, the one person, and I better be careful here, I don't want to get him in trouble. Uh, I'm going to rephrase this a little bit. Um, uh, something I think a lot of Americans don't know is that for many decades, uh, the California National Guard has had a training program with the Ukrainian military. Uh, because after the Soviet Union collapsed, we had something called the Partnership for Peace. Every newly independent state of the former Soviet Union was paired with a state in the United States uh, to help their military. Um, so I think like Alabama got Uzbekistan, if I'm not mistaken, California got Ukraine. And uh, that training, they were the ones, uh, California National Guard that was saying to me, Mike, these people are ready. These soldiers are ready because they didn't start fighting in 2022 they started fighting in 2014 when Putin first came in. And in retrospect, they were- That's the so interesting. Of all about how essential how was well President Zelensky in all this? Do you think if we, if Ukraine had not had a leader of his caliber and his, his sort of um, uh, determination that things might've been quite different? Because I think he was such an important symbol. Where are you going? Are you going to a better Wi-Fi area? Oh. oh. No, I'm just going to show you a photo I have of my there wall. There you are. The guy you're talking about. Because uh, he was here. He was here just a few months before that war. Um, and I was showing you that because, um, you know, I I'd followed Zelensky and I knew people on his team. But that was the first day I spent with him, Katie. And I spent the whole day with him. He loved Stanford, by the way. And um, he, he said, Mike, we got to build a Stanford in Ukraine. And we were actually you know, taking steps towards that uh, before this war tragically happened. And I've been in touch with him and his team ever since. Uh, we, um, and what I would say to you is his communication skills that, that I witnessed when he was here uh, have proven to be absolutely essential uh, for, you know, he's brilliant at it. And it takes a team, you know, okay, you, you have a team, right? It's not just him. He's got people around him. Well, he from, was, a, he was sort business, of right? adjacent from, from to my business. I mean, he was a television actor and a comedian, right? So 
I mean, which yes. is so crazy. And I think people exactly. thought it was sort of hilarious that he got elected, but wow, talk about rising to the occasion. I don't think we've seen anything quite like it in modern history. Yes. I agree. So he had those communication skills and then he had another thing called bravery. And uh, I remember uh, very vividly uh, the night before uh, Putin invaded. So February 23rd, literally a year ago today. Um, I was talking to one of his assistants. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, by the way, somebody who spent some time with us here at Stanford. His name's Sergei Lyshenko. Uh, and we were talking abstractly about what they're going to do. They were all down in the bunker, right? Uh, it was a very scary time for them all. And we were talking about the pluses and minuses of having a government in exile versus a government that might be captured in Kiev. Because remember, everybody at the time thought, the Russians were just going to march in, and there were assassination teams already marching around in the city. We now know that is true. And at the end of this conversation, it was very late at night. He said, Mike, but it's all abstract because Zelensky's going nowhere. Uh, he's going to stay here. He's going to die here if he has to. He's already in his mind made that decision. Uh, and then he very famously said, uh, two things. He got on something just like we're doing right now. He got on Instagram. I don't remember which platform, probably it was Telegram, but he held up his phone and he said, we toot. And I'm saying Russian. I don't, toot is the word I remember. It's a Ukrainian and Russian word. He said, here's my defense minister. Here's my chief of staff. We're here. We're not going anywhere. Right. Um, and then secondly, he said, very famously, he said, I don't need a ride. I need ammunition. Uh, and from that day forth, that bravery inspired those warriors that I'm talking about, right? They may have fought differently if he was sitting in Poland, uh, but he decided to stay there. He decided to not, not put on a suit anymore. You know, he's in military fatigues until this war is over. And I do think, uh, you know, we social scientists, mm -hmm. we tend to underestimate the role of individuals. We look for these kind of structural forces that cause history. I think this is a story where leadership mattered a lot and Zelensky really did, uh, you know, live up to the moment of the time. I want to keep saying so far, right? 2022, the Ukrainians won that year, but you judge the winners well, and wars let's, in the last year. So of let's, war, talk, about year. let's, so let's talk about, let's talk about, we have a uh, ways to go. Let's talk about what's to come. Uh, is this offensive going to be successful? Uh, what do you expect in the next six months? I know Zelensky has said that if he has more equipment and more, uh, you know, tools of war, that he could, this could be over by the spring. But yet he's not getting them. I mean, tell, tell us sort of what, how you see the next six months unfolding, Mike. Yeah, well, first, let me underscore about 2022 that Putin didn't achieve any of his military objectives, right? He didn't take over all of Ukraine. He didn't unite the alleged one nation of Slavs. You know, he just thinks Ukrainians are Russians with accents. That failed. He didn't take, he lost the Battle of Kiev, lost the Battle of Kharkiv, lost Kherson, um, and then expanded NATO if he was. So uh, that's the preambular thing. Fantastic victory. Uh, they've already freed up 50% mm. that the Russians took. But then the last, last several months, they've been in the stalemate. And as you rightly just pointed out, Zelensky and his team has made it known that they plan to launch a major counteroffensive in the spring. Now, they may be saying that deceptively. Well, let's be clear. You, you usually don't announce your war plans and then achieve them. I, I think we should be, be prepared to be surprised. But right now, they, they talk about this counteroffensive to try to divide the Russian army in the north from the Russian army in the south. Um, and he, like you rightly said, he, as he said at the Munich Security Conference uh, uh, by video where I was just a few days ago, give us the weapons and we'll get the job done. Uh, and in their opinion, we haven't given them uh, the weapons they need to do this, but they're going to try to do it anyway. Um, because they don't believe time's on their side. They think time's running out. They think they can't fight for years and years and years because 
Russians have more soldiers. Russians have more 18-year-olds than Ukrainians do. Uh, so they don't want a long war. They want a short war. And I don't want to predict where it's going to go, but I think the next Do you think they'll get more weapons from the pivotal. U.S. and NATO? Yes, they're getting more. And, you know, had a big breakthrough on tanks several, you know, last few weeks. Uh, but if you're Zelensky, I mean, you know, I talk to White House officials pretty often, including even today. Uh, you know, their, their view is we're doing as much as we can, as fast as we can. Um, but if you're Zelensky and you're getting the report every day of, you know, counting up how many Ukrainians died, uh, you can never give too much uh, and it never can be delivered fast enough. And that's just a kind of structural thing that's there. I would like our governments and the NATO countries to be going faster with what they're delivering. I think there's certain kinds of weapon systems this long range missile system, it's called an attackum in particular that, that I'm not a military expert, but I know lots of four star generals and they all say if, if we deliver that weapon system, that could be a breakthrough kind of weapon for the Ukrainians. And for some reason that I don't understand, uh, you know, our governments have chosen not to do that. Um, but, but they've done a lot. So, you know, they've done a lot. I wish they would do more. And even irrespective of what weapons they have, I think the Ukrainians and, and to, are going to do something major. I mean, what about up. Russia? I, I mean, do you think that they have, you know, we, you talked about underestimating their military capabilities, but do you think they have enough military capabilities? And as you mentioned, soldiers that under the, under the right circumstances, they could overtake the Ukrainian military. Yeah, that's, that's the hardest question of all, and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I would say right now, it appears to be no. That is, they're just throwing soldiers. There's this big battle for the city of Bakhmut right now in Ukraine. And I've talked to people very, you know, very involved in that battle on the Ukrainian side. And what they tell me, I, 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 there are many soldiers at this Munich security conference, by the way, who came uh, to talk about the war. And what they say is that Putin just doesn't care about his people, right? He's just letting these people be slaughtered, but mass matters. And, and uh, over time, a war of attrition, Russians just have more. And remember, you know, Putin's a dictator, so he can uh, order these, these young men into battle without any training. But, but it doesn't seem like it's a strategy to break through to take Kiev. It just, they're, they're, they're losing many soldiers just to make very incremental progress. And I don't know anybody that thinks they're going to solve that problem. Up the so. other morning and I looked at my phone with the headlines and that uh, the announcement that Russia is suspending its participation in the new start uh, treaty and, and the last remaining nuclear weapons treaty yes. between the U.S. and Russia, which you helped negotiate, by the way. I mean, that honestly sent a chill up my spine. Should it have? How concerned should we be and is Putin somehow signaling a willingness to new to use to you know nuclear weapons? Well, first it was bad news that he pulled out of that treaty, and you're right. I was part of the team that negotiated it. Flew with the president to, to Prague, and I was at the signing ceremony. That was one of the best days of my time working at the White House. By the way, that was a great trip, a very celebratory moment. Um, and then we got to yeah. ride through the U.S. Senate, by the way, Katie, that's not so easy to do either. I remember, I remember that day uh, driving there with the vice president. He's now the president and he presided at the Senate. And when we got that 71, we got 71 votes. And uh, that was the only day that I drank in the White House, by the way. I remember we all uh, celebrated with the president before he got on the plane to go to his Hawaii uh, vacation, as he used to always do. Uh, so it, for me personally, it's a tragic thing, but it's tragic for everybody. This, this treaty makes the world better off, uh, reduces by 30% the number of nuclear weapons in the world, and most importantly, uh, has in place an inspections regime so that we know what they're doing with their nuclear program and they know what we're was doing. It so saber not, was it, not was it saber rattling, um, Mike, or was it, I mean, is it a significant threat? Is it saying, is it 
is it not only saying we, we pulled out a start, but we're willing to to use nuclear weapons in this conflict? So I would say no, not yet. Um, uh, we want to get back into the treaty, but we're going to be fine for a while because we've been collecting this data for many, many decades, right? And remember, they just suspended, they didn't, they didn't fully cancel their participation. So there's a glimmer of hope that they might renegotiate. But you're asking a harder question, which is, will Putin use nuclear weapons? Um, and I would say two things. I would split out kind of against us versus against Ukrainians. Against us, I think that is a very low zero, zero, zero point five percent probability, right? Uh, for the simple fact that uh, uh, we still have enough nuclear weapons to blow up Russia. They still have enough to blow us up. Us up. That's called mutual assured destruction. And I don't think Putin's suicidal. I don't think he wants to die in a bunker in a nuclear I hope uh, exchange so. with us. So I think that's off the table. Um, well, I, 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 I believe so. And by the way, so does the Biden administration. They follow this very closely. They think that's a very low probability event. One you want to focus on, right? Even if it's a low probability event, you want it to be even lower, right? If it's 0 0.01, you want it to be 0 0.001. That's the job of policymakers, but I think that's highly unlikely. But there's a second scenario. Would he use a nuclear weapon inside Ukraine, what they call a tactical nuclear weapon, not a strategic one, um, that would be so catastrophic can for the Ukrainians? You expect, can I stop you for stop just a fighting? second? Because, you know, I love to learn yeah. along with people who are following me. Explain what a tactic, tactical nuclear weapon is versus a strategic one. Great question. And by the way, uh, it's not just your uh, viewers. A professor here at Stanford literally just two weeks ago stopped me on the street and said, Mike, I heard you talk about tactical versus strategic on TV. This is a distinction without a difference. It has a difference, but, but I'm, I'm glad you, you're focused on it because basically strategic uh, refers to the delivery vehicle that <laughs> delivers uh, the weapon. And by strategic, we mean Something that go uh, an that's an ICBM, intercontinental right? ballistic missile. Weapon. I remember from uh, my Pentagon days. Yeah, ballistic missile. Yes. Yeah. Good for you. Um, or SLICM. Do you remember that uh, acronym? Submarine right. launched crew uh, ballistic missile. Right. So that's another kind of weapon. Uh, and then there's a third one, which is a long range bomber. In our system, it's the B fifty two that flies <clears throat> and delivers. You know these strategic strategic distances. A tactical nuclear weapon is one that can be uh, used in a battlefield, in a battle zone. It can be launched from a, you know, a delivery vehicle that doesn't go into the sky. That's, that's the, only, the only difference. And you know what? I'm gonna never make that distinction again because they're both really bad. They're both nuclear weapons. But, but the, other, How they're sorry, the others are matter short matter. range um, and what they can do Tell us the, the destruction they can rot once, they, once they're, you know, fired or whatever, launched, I guess. Well, well different ones have different uh, capabilities. Uh, but, you know, think of, think of 1945. That's, that's what you, they're, they're smaller nuclear weapons now. But, yeah, they'll do a lot of damage and in an indiscriminate way, right? They're not tactical makes it sound like they're just, you know, hitting certain military targets. No, this Are would be like you know, blowing up Nagasaki? cities in Ukraine. And it would be, it, it, it could be smaller. We have new, we have new weapons that could be smaller, but catastrophic. I think people need to get their heads around. This would be horrific uh, if, if Putin ever did it. Um, and by the way, might have consequences for even countries like Russia, depending on which way the wind was blowing at that time and where they used them. Um, but it, where this is getting too scary for me, because I don't think it's, I think it's very, very unlikely, even in this kind of space. And let me explain why. Um, number one, everybody, not everybody, but oftentimes people think uh, they go back to just like we're those nuclear weapons 
and the, the, you know, the Japanese said, okay, we're done. We don't want to keep fighting. But that's a very different moment in the history of World War II versus the history of this war. Uh, I predict that if Putin used a nuclear weapon inside Ukraine, uh, Zelensky would get on TV as soon as he could uh, and say, you know, we're doubling our efforts. We're not going to quit. Uh, this, this, you know, horrific monster in Moscow, we're going to fight to the very end. And most Ukrainians would rally to his cause. They weren't, you know, remember the Japanese had been fighting for years and years and years and were losing the war. They knew they were going to lose the war. It was just a matter of time. That's not the mood uh, amongst Ukrainians now. I was just with, you know, dozens of them uh, in Munich. That is not their mood. Number two, um, who's going to support Putin if he does that? Uh, right now, he's got he's in this space where the the Chinese are, you know, trying to have their cake and eat it too. But but the, they're not criticizing Mr. Putin the way we would like. There are dozens of countries around the world that are also on the sidelines. He uses a nuclear weapon. He becomes a pariah for the rest of his time. I mean, just think about what that'll feel like, you know, uh, around the world. And that gets me to number three that is even more speculative. I'm not even so sure that his own generals would go along with that uh, because they know that that would be uh, cementing their pariah status in the world, maybe even the, in their own country. So I, I just, you know, for all those reasons, I think there's not a lot of sense in using it. I just How will he if he does not achieve do. his military goals? And this is going to be my last question. Thank you, Mike, for doing this. It's fascinating. And you're so great at making it understandable. But if he doesn't have military success, how is he going to, quote unquote, save face? I know that you have said before that victory is elastic. Um, so what do you mean exactly by yes. that? And if he's not successful, which all, you know, I think most of the world hopes he is not, um, how does he get out of this without feeling completely humiliated for a guy who has an ego the size of this country? Right. It's a hard question, and I don't want to pretend I know exactly the answer, although you know, I've been dealing and following Putin's we first met in 1991, Katie. I don't know if I've ever told you that. So we, we have a long history. We're not exactly Facebook friends, but uh, um, I've followed him. I've listened to him and I know people around him. I, I'd say a couple of things. One is uh, for everybody tuning in today, you need to know that if you listen to Russians uh, programs, uh, the Katie Couriches of Russia, uh, the way they frame this war right now, it's not a war with Ukraine. It's a war with us. They're fighting the United States of America. They're fighting NATO. Uh, that's the way they frame it. And so one way he can declare victory is that we stopped the NATO invasion of Russia. That's what he's told his people. Uh, so we heroically stopped NATO in Ukraine to prevent them from invading our country. And he could say that. And many people would believe him. That's the first, you know, elastic win. In, that's one part of the story. Second, when he first started this war, he said this was a special military operation in Ukraine. Over the course of time, uh, especially last fall, he changed it. He said it's a special military operation. You can't say the word war, right? Go to jail if you say the word war in Russia. Special military operation, Zashita Donbasa, in defense of Donbass. Uh, that's the region where the separatists had been. That's where the fighting is going on now. And he said he was going to liberate the citizens of Donbass, you know, Russian speakers in right. Donbass, from the Nazis. This is all, prop, you know, this is, not, this is him speaking, not me, from the Nazis. And he could say that tomorrow, that we protected them, we liberated them from the Nazis in Kiev victory. And third to that story, if he, if he did it tomorrow, he could say they were going to take Crimea. We stopped them from taking Crimea. Um, and if he wanted to sue for peace tomorrow, I think he could say that and call some leaders in Europe and say, I'll, I'll stop fighting if you let me stay in Donbass, you let me stay in Crimea. And there are most certainly leaders in Europe who would support that. And then he would say to them, 
but you got to tell that crazy Zelensky to stop trying to take back this territory. Uh, and that would put Zelensky in a very difficult position because he has told his people that they're going to do whatever it takes to go back to the 1991 borders. And that includes Donbass and that includes uh, Crimea. So I don't know what he would do. But if Putin's looking for uh, an exit strategy, I think he's got him. And, and I was going to ask you should know about how Russian the Russian people are feeling about public... all of this. They had that big rally. Is that pure propaganda and a very small sampling of the population? Or, or do they support it? So again, to oversimplify a bit, but I, I think of three different categories of Russians. There's 25% or so hardcore Putin supporters, love him no matter what and support him no matter what. They're the ones that watch his propaganda. There's another 20% that can't stand this war, don't speak about it because it's dangerous to, but are against him. <clears throat> and by the way, the demographics are very clear in the polling. I used to do poll a lot of polling in Russia and I know all the polling firms well. In that first category, it's the older you are, um, the less educated you are, the, uh, the poorer you are, uh, and the more rural area you live, the more you support Putin, and conversely, in the anti-war camp, that's the young people, educated, urban, and rich. Uh, those demographics might sound familiar, right? Uh, I, I think we have them in our country too. Um, uh, and by the way, that also means that Putin's lost the future, right? Um, but, but then in the middle, Katie, there's this giant group. I think it's more like as, as high as 70% that supported Putin when he went to war because you support your president when you go to war, right? Rally around the flag effect. And most certainly that happens in our country. It happens around the world. And then they're not really that enthusiastic about this war. And they became really unenthusiastic when he announced the draft, right? Uh, for 300,000 new soldiers. By the way, as many Russian uh, men left Russia when he announced that as joined the army, that's a data point about enthusiasm for the war. But they're just, you know, they're going along, they're not enthusiastic, but they support their president, especially because he says we're fighting NATO, we're fighting the United States. But that means, I think, that if he announced peace tomorrow, they would support it in a heartbeat. Uh, the vast majority of Russians, they would take whatever terms he says. And this notion that, you know, the hardliners, you know, the you know, Progosians and the, these various characters that you hear in the press, the hardliners might, might, would be upset and they might even overthrow Putin. I don't believe that for a minute. I think he could, people in Russia want peace. Not that hardcore group I talked about, but the vast majority, if he announced it, they would accept it and he, he would still remain in power. I just don't know if he wants to do that. What I worry about is he's, you know, he declared he's gonna annex these territories in Ukraine. And I think he believes if he just waits it out, we, the Americans, the American people will get tired of this war. Uh, the Europeans will get tired of this war. And time is on his side. And that's hey, I what I just the most. ask one last question. And if this war has been so barbaric and gruesome. Uh, I mean, all war is barbaric and gruesome. But this, the, the crimes against humanity uh, have been pretty stunning. And I forget the number of estimated war crimes. I think Kamala Harris said something about that this week, like 48,000 cases. I can't remember, so forgive me if I'm quoting the wrong number. But will these yeah. war crimes ever be prosecuted, Mike? And and if so, how? And, you know, will, will there be any repercussions for this? Well, I certainly hope there will be. I think there has to be. Um, and, and by the way, you're letting me advertise something. For those who want to learn more, uh, tune in. Uh, I'll, I'll put it on tw uh, Twitter after we're done. We have an event tomorrow at the Institute I run here at Stanford at noon tomorrow with four Ukrainians speaking by Zoom. They're all alums of our training programs here, Katie, just so you know. One of them spent a year here with us uh, several years ago. Her name's Alexandra Matvichuk. Wow. Uh, and she just won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, 
for documenting these crimes against humanity. Yeah. And she'll be speaking tomorrow. So tune in if you want to get more, uh, hear more. Um, but I think it's really important, not just because of what the horrific things that have happened in inside Ukraine, but we have to deter this from happening in the future. And if you don't punish these kind of crimes, you're opening the opportunity for other tyrants to do the same. So uh, I, I, I was in the audience when Vice President Harris said they have committed crimes against humanity uh, in Munich. Uh, I was, and that went down very well in that hall with the Ukrainians that were there. Uh, I give the Biden administration credit for calling it for what it is, but they have to follow through afterwards and they're, they have to be held Well, Mike McFall, always great done. to talk to you. Thanks for your time. Thank you for tweeting that because that sounds like a very interesting conversation. And, you know, we have to bear witness and hear the hard, cold, gruesome facts of what has transpired in that country so people can be held accountable, as you said. And uh, we really appreciate your yes. time, Mike. You've got all those engineers at Stanford. Tell them to work on your Wi-Fi. <laughs> yes, Katie. Seriously, it. I got it. I'm let's end. I better. I better. I'm gonna get in trouble here, but it is with all that we do, and in the valley, uh, the place that I work, we have terrible That's, uh, communication okay. setup. Okay, but tell so, tell those, tell those engineers so to get to get, get going on that. Right. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Thanks everyone I for will. watching. Um,